you got your homework number four, right? This is problem set number four. I made it due next the following Monday, so you have some like ten days on this one. Yeah. Um, so next Friday. And this deals with bipolar circuits. So you know, deal, uh, this homework set mostly deals with bipolar transistors and circuits. And uh, you also got your next handout, which is the first part of the low frequency behavior of single stage amplifiers. It deals with bipolar transistors. So what we will do in the next several lectures, we'll, talk, we'll start talking about circuits. We'll start talking about circuits. We'll start with this very basic building blocks. So eventually we'll see that you can think about circuit design as putting Legos together, one way of thinking about it, or painting. So these are very basic blocks we'll talk about. So it's very important for all of us to make sure that we understand the basic properties of these blocks, these building blocks, well enough. Because then later on, what we'll do, we quickly go through these blocks and go, oh, oh, this is a common emitter, this is a common base, so we can put it together, and this has this kind of input impedance, and this has that kind of input impedance, and we'll calculate every single one of them. So that's why it's important for us to do this, even if, even though you may have seen some of this material before, it's important to make sure that we go through this and understand how these building blocks work. Because these are what we'll be using later on a lot. Okay? So let's start with talking about making an amplifier with a bipolar transistor. So we've talked about bipolar transistor. We looked at the device physics, and eventually we kind of what it boiled down to was that it was a voltage-controlled current source, right? What we could control was the collector current in the forward active region, which was related to base voltage, base emitter voltage, more accurately, through an exponential dependence the first order. So the first order, we knew that this was the behavior of, this described the behavior of a bipolar transistor, where IS was some sort of a current, it's a small current, uh, called saturation current, and the VT is KT over Q, which is at room temperature, which at room temperature is, um, is about 25.8 millivolts. Okay? Now, if I want to make a voltage amplifier out of this, the simplest way to make a voltage amplifier is what? By a voltage amplifier, I mean if an amplifier whose input is a voltage and whose output is a voltage. Well, the output of this thing, if it remains in forward active region, is a current, right? So I need to convert this current into a voltage. So what is the easiest way, the simplest way to convert a, volt, a current to a voltage? Resistor. Put it through a resistor, right? Use Ohm's law. So if I put it through a resistor, RC, I can convert it to a voltage again. So this would be V out. This would be V in. Now, of course, this, this transistor has to remain in the forward active region, right? In other words, what should I do about the junction between the base and the collector? What should I have? Should it be forward bias or reverse bias? Reverse. Reverse bias, right? For it to remain in the forward active region. Which means that this voltage has to be higher than this voltage. Or not much lower, let's say. Right? So this has to be a connected to a higher voltage. We call it VCC, a positive power supply. So this is the basic, the most basic amplifier you face. You have a voltage control current source, and then you convert it back to voltage through a resistor, and then you have a supply voltage that's high enough to maintain this in forward active region where this equation holds. If you leave the forward active region, this equation does not hold anymore. So, this kind of amplifier, if you see, the input is really applied between the base and the emitter, right? And the, which in this case is ground. And the output is taken between the output and the emitter, between the collector and the emitter, right? So the common terminal between the input and output, you can draw it like that, right? Is the emitter, and hence it's called the common <coughs> emitter. Transfer 
function, but characteristic. So V and V L, if you look at this, if I can, I can plot this, so V in, V out versus V in. So at zero V in, what is V out? Well, if this voltage V is zero, what can I say about this transistor? Well, this charge is not forward biased. So this, this charge is off, that charge is off, the current is zero. You also see it from that expression. So the output is in VCC. Right? And then as I increase Vn, I start drawing more current, pulling more current out of this. And as I sink more current, basically this voltage starts going down. Right? Because the voltage drop across this guy starts increasing, and this voltage is fixed, so it starts coming down. So how would it change? Well, according to that equation, which is an exponential. Something like that. Now, would it do this? Would it go negative? No. no. What happens before that? Eventually, the is going to, or the current pulled across the RC is going to be equal to VCC. It's well, it's not going to reverse bias. Exactly, even yeah. before that, right? Right, right if just as long when this voltage gets below that this voltage, if V is greater than this one by something like 0.5 volt or 0.6 volt, right? This junction is forward by two, so I'm in saturation, and what I have here between the CC, v, the collector and the emitter, as we saw before, is like a very small battery, so like 0 0.5, 0 0.1, or 0 0.2 volts. So I hit the V sat, saturation voltage, instead. That's the kind of behavior I will have eventually. This is VCC sat at 0.1 volt. Kind of in this, sorry. Now, so is this an amplifier? Yeah, well, it is. Depending on how you, where you look at it. So, how can I use this as an amplifier? Well, what if I apply, if I have a certain operation point, if I apply a DC level to the input, let's say some VCC. And then on top of that, I apply a small signal variation like this, I will see that that variation gets amplified. This will not be exactly sinusoid because it's an exponential, but for a small perturbation, I can get that amplification, right? So that will happen around my operation point at the output. <coughs> So this is the DC part, and this is the AC part. Okay, now, what can I say about the gain of this amplifier? Well, if I need gain for a nonlinear system, it's kind of a tricky thing, right? Because it depends on what kind of input I apply. But if the input is small, I may be able to capture what my gain is. How do I calculate my gain? Or something like this. If I were to calculate what the gain for a small perturbation of the input is, what would that be in terms of this graph? Well, yeah, but how would I calculate it? Correct, it's a ratio of 2. The slope of the thing. The slope of the thing. The slope of tangent, right, at this point. So if I draw a tangent here and calculate its slope, it should give me the gain. So first off, right, right off of that, we can tell that this is an inverting amplifier. But you increase the input voltage, I mean, you can see even from the large signal behavior. You increase the input voltage, the output voltage goes down. So it has negative gain. Now, how do I, what is the slope of this thing? How do I calculate it? Isn't it just the derivative of V out versus V in? Right? So what is that derivative? Let's calculate it. Well, this is a constant. This is VCC, actually. Um, this is a constant. OK? So this is the only part I have to differentiate. What is the derivative of that? So it's 1 over Vt times the same thing, right? So it's Rc, Ic over Vt, E exponential of Vn over Vt. Now, what is this quantity? Uh, I'm sorry, it's not that oh. This quantity. Right? What IC? The IC at this point, exactly. In other words, it's the quantity.
quiescent current, the bias current, the, the DC part, so it's ICQ, right? So this is IC, let's say quiescent, times RC divided by VT, divided by VT and the minus sign, right? That's my gain. That's my DC gain. What it tells you is that if I want more gain, I have to be operating at higher currents. For as long as I'm in forward active region, so this is valid only in the forward active region, in this region. Beyond that, it's not valid. But it tells me I get more gain here than there. Which is another way, another way of saying that I have to, the slope is larger here than there. At least the absolute value of the slope is larger there than here. Right? That's fine. And it tells me the larger RC, the higher my gain will be. The larger the correct collector cut, based on the simplified model. Okay? So this is the basic way of looking, one basic way of looking at it. But now, let's see if we could arrive at a similar result from the small single model. So I will do one with the pi model initially, and I'll redo it with the T model later. So what is the pi model for this transistor? Or bipolar transistor. There's an R pi here, so this is V pi. Look around. This is GM V pi. This is, and there's an R O, right? So this is a basic transistor. And we are dealing with it at low frequencies. For the rest of this quarter, we'll be dealing with low frequency stuff, so we won't worry about capacitors. And next quarter, we'll deal the dynamics. So, this is Vn. From a small signal perspective, I only see the lowercase Vn, right? Because this is just an incremental model. This deals with the changes. And that's why I don't show the capital Vn, the, the operation point, DC part. I only show the AC part. Right? So if there's no variation, it's Vn is zero. Now, what do I have on this side? This is the collector, right? Where is it connected? In the small signal model? RC. RC, okay. Now where's RC connected? Ground. Ground. Why ground? Because DC requires a Right. Because again, this is a variational model. It only uses variations. And it's things that are constant, they generate their basic value. So basically, if you have a voltage source that's constant, it's a short circuit. It's a supply, shorted to ground. Right? And if you have a current source that's zero, it's an open circuit. Now, this is V out, this is lowercase V out. So now, I want to see if I can calculate my gain from this calculation. So, I make one assumption for now. I assume that RC is still much smaller than RO. And we know this is not a crazy assumption, right? Because RO we saw is relatively large, in the hundreds of kilos. So let's say for now, let's assume that, and we'll come back and see how things will change when this assumption does not fall. So, with that assumption, basically the parallel combination of these two is pretty much RC, right? So I can ignore this part for now. But for now, let's ignore R. So this is the most basic, simple model I have for this transistor, for this amplifier. So let's see, how can I calculate my gain? What is my gain? What is V5? Vn. I want to define, basically I want to find an expression for V out in terms of Vn. Right, to get find again. So V pi is nothing but Vn. So this is nothing but Gm Vn. So what is this voltage? There's a current source being pulled out of a resistor connected to ground. This is minus that current, Gm Vn, times the resistor, right? Why minus? Because it's being pulled out. This voltage will be negative in this perspective, in the variational sense. Therefore, the gain, the voltage gain, is going to be minus GM RC. But what is GM? We did that, ca that calculation, right? What is GM of a bipolar transistor? This is one thing you should remember. IC over VT. IC over VT, exactly. GM is IC in other words, ICQ over VT. Therefore, this is nothing but RC ICQ over VT, or simply GMRC, which is exactly the same thing you got from that. 
certainly a surprise. Isn't it? Both of them are calculating their variations, right? So you see exactly the same thing from the small signal model, but it, was, it is, in this case, a little bit easier to deal with it in the small signal model, because you can almost by inspection look at it and say, well, of course, it's GMRC. But that's the same voltage. Right? Now, so that's the basic model. That's the very basic model. Now, we also had a, another model, a second model, right, for this white motor transistor, which was the T model. So that was the pi model. Let's do it with the T model one more time. And the reason I'm doing it with the T model here is that, except for perhaps this example, in every other example, T model is more, gives you an easier path to calculating the uh, result. But in any case, you have access to these two models, the, P model, the pi model and the T model, that are exactly equivalent. So it's your choice. You can use either one, whatever suits you better. So let's see. Let's, what is the T, how did the T model for the surface look like? So you have the VN. This was the base. This was alpha Rn, right? And this was IE. There was a collective, there was a emitter current, which was alpha IE. And where was this connected? Well, there was RO, which for now we ignored, and there's the RC between collector and ground. And this is the out. Let's see if we arrive at the same result in this model. So what I need to calculate, the intermediate variable here, instead of being the pi, is IE. Right. What is IE in terms of unit? If I tell you this voltage is Vn, what can you tell me about IE? Vn over. Exactly. This is inconsequential. If I tell you what this voltage is, it doesn't matter what else is connected to it. It's a voltage across a resistor. So its current is determined by that voltage divided by the resistor, ohms law. Right? This is another way of saying that this is really a voltage source, right? A voltage source in parallel with the current source is what? Is the voltage source. A voltage source in series with the current source is what? Just the current source. Right? So, this is another way of saying the same thing. So, here, IE is Vn over alpha Rm. But Rm, we know, is 1 over Gm by definition. So that's IE. What I need to know is this current, which is alpha IE. So this voltage is alpha I minus alpha IE times RC, which I know is minus alpha RC divided by alpha RM times VN. Therefore, AB, which is a voltage gain, which is defined as V alpha over VN, is simply the ratio of these two minus RC over RM, or equivalently minus GMRC, by definition, RM1 over GM. You arrive at exactly the same result, minus GMRC. And it should have been surprising if I had arrived at a different result. If I actually had arrived at a different result, it means that I had done something wrong, because these two models are exactly equivalent the two models of the Okay, fine. So that's my amplifier, that's my gain. But now I ignored one thing in both of these models. So in my pi model, I really ignored what? I ignored RO. I said, well, uh, let's assume that RC is much smaller than RO. But let's forget that, uh, that assumption. So let's say they are not necessarily uh, so much different. So they could be on the same order in principle. So what happens now? How would I recalculate my gain? Exactly. It's just a now the new RC is a parallel combination of these two. Right? So if I look at the parallel combination of this, this behaves like the old RC. So now my new gain, AB, would be simply minus GM times RO in parallel with RC. Now, if RO is much greater than RC, this basically becomes GMRC. It reduces the previous result. So that shouldn't be that surprising. Now, let's talk about one, uh, let me just quickly talk about it, one, give you a numerical example. Let's talk about a numerical example, then we'll look at it in a slightly different way too. Um, actually, you know, let, 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 let's look at the load lines first. So, there's another way of still looking at the same circuit. So, I'll, we'll look at it in a third way. So, there are all, so the first way we looked at, we wrote the equation, we wrote the nonlinear equation, we, we calculated the V and V out. 
current increases, as the current increases, the voltage drop across the resistor drop increases, and therefore the output voltage drop. The other way to look at it was the small signal model, basically the incremental model. We have variations here that translate the variations there out of phase with the minus sign, which basically means that we have an inverted gain. Now, yet a third way to look at this is through the load line. So if you look at the VIC versus VB, VCE plots, so this is VCE, this is IC, for the transport of bipolar transistor, we saw that they look like this, right? And they are not equally spaced, of course, because you have this exponential behavior. So if you look at this, these are for different VBs. So this is VBE equals 0.60, that's it. Just I'm making some numbers. Oh, right? 0 0.67, 
So what am I getting? Well, I know my gain is minus GMRC, obviously, for now. And so what is that? What is GM? GM is 1 milliamp divided by 25, well, approximately 25 millivolts, which is the VT, which is around 40 millisiemens. And so that's basically minus 40 millisiemens times 1 kilo ohm. Kilo cancels milli, ohm cancels siemens. So you get a gain of minus 40. So I have a voltage gain of minus 40. No okay, okay, it's a reasonable. Got it. But now, what if I had to take the RO into account? So let's see, what do I need to calculate RO? VA is basically, uh, let's, I have to give you the VA, the early voltage, right? So let's say the early voltage is 50 volts for this transistor. So, I have to see what my RO is. RO, we, we've calculated this before, is VA over IC. Right. And that's 50 volts, 50 volts divided by uh, 1 milliamp, which gives you what? Milli gives you a kilo, so it's 50 kilo ohms. So, more accurately, my gain really is minus GM times RC in parallel with RO. So, this is 1 kilo ohm, this is 50 kilo ohms. So what is the parallel combination? It's almost one kilo ohms, right? It's a little less than that. So instead of 40, it's going to be minus 30, minus 39. But we already know that there are a lot of approximations and assumptions involved in this. Right? And arriving at this model, and then it's an incremental model, it's only valid for small variations. So in this case, it doesn't hurt me a lot if I just ignore this and say, well, my gain is approximately minus 40. Because I can't predict my gain that accurately anyway. I have this kind of error anyway, so I might as well live with what I have. Okay, any questions so far? Now, one of the things that's interesting to do, now this is just for the numerical analysis, but let's do something. The question is, how can I increase my gain if 40 was not enough? What can I do to increase my gain? Let's look at these pictures, the three pictures that they have. Let's say I want higher gain. What can I do? That's one, one option, I can increase my current, right? But that means that I'm spending more power. So let's say I have a power budget. I don't want to burn a hole in the, um, you know, the chip. Right. And I have a limit. Let's say I have a cap of 1 milliamp per stitch. That's true. I mean, I can increase the current and get more gain. But let's say if I can gain something without having to increase the power consumption. You can use multiple stages. Well, yeah, but let's say I want to get it out of one stage. Now, the, one of this is an interesting question. Why don't we use multiple stages? And one of the things we'll see in the next couple of lectures is that I'm, we'll try to maximize the gain per stage. And there's a very good reason for it, which will become evident in the next quarter. That's something with the to do with the dynamics of the amplifier and stability. But keep that, just accept that for now, and I promise you we'll come back to it and talk about it when we get there. But the objective here is to maximize the gain per stage. So let's see what the limit is. Let's find out what the limit is. Because even if you go to two stages, you have to burn twice as much current, right? Even if you want. So I, or you have to cut the current of each stage by factor of two, which is going to be interesting to see how cascade works. But let's forget about the cascade. Let's forget. Let's say within one stage, with a given power consumption, I want to increase my gain. What can I do? <coughs> RC, exactly. So the load resistance. If I use a larger load resistor, it seems that it will help me. Now, what does it mean in this picture? A larger RC. Comes down. This load line kind of comes less slanted, right? And this is VCC over RC prime, which is greater than RC. <coughs> so, how the hell is this helping me? Well, look at it again. Now, for the same change in a VB in the input, right? So now I have a larger delta V. Let's call this delta V two. And here we have, well, here we are kind of hitting saturation, so let's not worry about it. Okay. And this is of course when, when I'm hitting saturation, right? This region. This is the saturation region. <coughs> but before I hit saturation, I see that for a change in, in a, for the same change in the input, I get a larger output. So how far can I take this? To the point where our RC parallel R not remains valid to reduce the RC. Exactly. So in general, what is it? so but let's say I go beyond that, let's say I may keep increasing my RC. Would 
put my game goal to infinity? No, because then if this becomes quite large, then this dominates, right? So what is the limit of the game? So what's the maximum five what game you can get? A B max out of the stitch. So you tend to ask for that. I don't think you're learning stitch. So what is the maximum game according to that expression? GM R O, right? GM R O. Now, what is GM? GM is I C over V T, right? I C Q. Quite simple. What is V A? What is R O? It's V A over I C Q. Okay. Now it's interesting, isn't it? It's independent of current in this case. The game is determined by the ratio of VA over VT. The maximum game we're going to achieve. And it's independent of current. And it's kind of easy to understand because the more you increase the current, your GM becomes larger, but your RO becomes smaller by the same amount. Your resistance becomes smaller, but your transconductance, the strength of the transistor becomes larger. Now, this limit it's actually called by definition 1 over A. And this kind of A is sometimes used to, for, it's a no parameter for bipolar transistor at a given temperature. So let's say at room temperature for the transistor we just talked about. What is it? We said VA was 50 volts. VT was 25 millivolts at room temperature. So that's about what? That's about <coughs> 2000, right? So it tells you from this transistor, with this, in this kind of amplifier stage, in a common emitter amplifier, this is the maximum gain you can get out of this kind, this simple amplifier. So this is the best you can hope for. So it's a good thing to know, right? Because for instance, if your spec is to gain a gain of 10,000, then you know you shouldn't be wasting your time on this stage at all. You have to do something else. There are a lot of other things you can do. But just that, that's a valuable information, that's a valuable piece of information. So that's the limit. Now, let me ask you a question. This amplifier, the way we've designed it, so we talk about all okay now. It also is an amplifier, but it has the input and output, right? Now, what if I ask you what is the input impedance of this amplifier? You have to be able to determine that. Why do we care about the input impedance? Because I know, I want to know the thing that drives this amplifier, what kind of load it sees. Right? It's important to know that, and it's also important to know what kind of output impedance I have for this amplifier. So what, is the input, what are the input and output impedances of this amplifier? Well, it's kind of in this example, it's kind of obvious, right? When you look at it, you can see the input impedance looks like R pi, and the output impedance maybe, I don't know, maybe the output impedance is not that obvious. But in general, if I have a more sophisticated, complicated circuit, how do I determine the input and output impedance? Well, I can apply a test voltage or a test current source and measure the other parameter, and the ratio of those with the small signal model, which is a linear model, will give you the impedance, right? So here, if I apply an independent input, Vx, well, it's obvious that I calculate Ix. What is the ratio of Vx over Ix? Well, in this case, I know Ix is simply Vx divided by R pi. So this is Vx divided by Vx over R5, which gives you R5. So my input impedance in this case is simply the R5. Right? In our example, what is that input impedance? So for our example, R5 is what? What is R5? It's beta over GM, right? I have to give you beta, so let's say beta is 100. Beta is 100 divided by 25 millivolts, that's what? Oh, I'm sorry, well, not 25, not 25, no, 40 millisieverts, I'm sorry. Not the GF, right? 40 millisieverts, so that's 2.5 kilohertz. Right? So it's about 2.2 kilohertz, several kilohertz in this example. Okay, fine. It's not very high, it's not very low either. Okay, so and we'll see other examples. So I'm just giving you a numerical example to get a sense for how big or how small this parameter is. Now, what is R out? How about output resistance? How do I calculate that? Well, to calculate the output resistance, I do the same thing. I 
apply a test voltage for test current. So that the general procedure is to apply a test voltage and test or test current and measure the other parameter. But at the same time, you have to set all the independent sources, which are shown as a circle, right? Other independent sources. Now the, all the other independent sources are set them to zero. Now, what kind of other sources do I have here in this circuit? Initially, if I had a VN, this was a voltage source, right? This is a VN. So what it means is that if I null VN, if I a voltage source with a value of zero, what is it? What is a voltage source with a value of zero? It's a short circuit. So it means that I'm shorting it to ground. Now, if I had a current source here, for example, what would it do? What is a current source with a value of zero? It's an open circuit, right? So for now, it means that this guy is zero. But I won't touch the dependent sources, which I show as kind of as diamonds. That's the distinction I make. This is a voltage control. This is the action of, this is the catalytic action of the transistor, right? The action of the transistor is still there. I, I'm not supposed to change that. So I leave that here, but let's, let's capture it. If I apply an IX here, what can I say about this current, by the way? Yeah. Well, I have to say what V pi is. What is V pi? Zero, right? This resistor is shorted on both sides to ground. So V pi is zero. Then what can I say about this current source? It's a this circuit. turns out to be zero because of this. I don't force it to be zero, right? It's an open circuit. So it's zero. It's open circuit. It disappears. What do I? What else do I have? It's just a parallel combination of RC and R out. So R out. Is, this is simply R out. So R out is going to be R over in parallel with RC. Yes. If I have what? I'm sorry. Multimeter. Yeah. And can you just throw it between the uh, base and the emitter? So you can get the input resistance? Yeah. No, actually you can't. I'll tell you what. Not the multimeter. Right? The thing is that, remember, this is not, this is just a variation, the model, right? This is just the representation of the derivatives. The multimeter will give you the ratio of the large signal current, capital I C the capital VB, or capital VB to capital IC, right? This one is the ratio of the variations, and they're not the same thing. If you want to get an effect of a multimeter, what you need to do, you need to apply an AC signal, a small sine wave, input voltage, and measure the current, which is exactly what we did, which is what multimeter does, but it does it for DC. It applies a certain current, measures the voltage, or vice versa. Ohmmeter, I guess, right? Yeah. That's what it does. So, so that's the input resistance, that's the output resistance. Now, one of the interesting things about the stage is though, that if you look at this transfer function, you have this gain only over a very limited region. Right? And if I try to increase my gain, what happens to this region? becomes even narrower, right? And this is a very basic limitation, and this is a very basic fun and fundamental trade-off. If you increase the gain, your region of operation will make it become smaller for a given supply voltage, right? So if I want to get higher gain, the only way I can get it is by limiting basically my region of operation. So I have to make sure I'm, I remember in this region. It kind of makes sense, right? Because if I have a huge gain, let's say I, re I get close to that limit. Then I, I, there's no way to get a very large signal out beyond VCC out here. So even with the range, with the supply, with the output range of VCC, if you divide it by the gain, that corresponds to a very small input voltage. So there is this very kind of fundamental limit uh, trade-off between the limit, the range of operation, the useful range of operation, and the gain. So the higher the gain, the smaller that becomes. Now the other thing is that. We said, well, to increase the gain, we just need to increase RC, right? So if you keep increasing RC, one of the things that happens is that we gradually arrive and get closer and closer to this region of operation where we have very little current, right? And that may be okay, but if I want to drive anything, for instance, a capacitor or another load, then that can become problematic. So is there a way of maintaining this transistor at a relatively non-zero current level? And at the same time, getting very high gain. Wouldn't a load line? So ideally, what I want 
is a long line that looks like this. It's a straight line. Right? Would that help me? Because, yeah, it does help me because if I change this a little bit, if this goes from here to there, and I get the maximum gain which I can get, without having to operate the zero curve. But this is not a resistor anymore. What is it? What kind of component gives me this kind of behavior, a flat low line? It's a constant current, right? It's a current source. So if I had access to a current source, and we'll see how we can make current sources later. If I could use a current source here, I could arrive at that limit. Yes, but then the thing is that the only current that can be maintained through an infinite resistor, right, without an infinite voltage drop is zero. So the DC current will become zero. So it may be okay as is, but then the problem is that it can't drive anything. So the output is like always? The, the only way you can have an infinite resistor here is to have zero current. It's like an open, right? Infinite resistor is open. So the only way that the transistor will be stuck. But the difference is that when you put a current source here, you maintain a constant DC current, but from an AC perspective, it's not open. So you want something that's not infinite, it's not infinite from a DC perspective, but offered to an infinite resistance from an AC perspective. That's why we use a, that's why see a, an infinite resistor is the straight line here. A current source is a straight line at any other point. So, that's for basic, that's for the basic common emitter amplifier. Now, I'll stop here, and then next time we'll talk about variations of this uh, common emitter amplifier, and then we'll continue talking about other stages and complete our discussion. You have it in your head now, anyway. And since this, this next homework is due on Monday, so we get two more lectures before it, anyway. Any questions? Uh, next, after, uh, I think on uh, next Friday or on the following uh, Wednesday, I'll give it, I'll give it out. So it, it, it kind of is like the next homework session, when this one is done. It's kind of like that. There's no, there's one week we have to have no sign up to the